alaikum everybody, good afternoon. Uh, actually, uh, in this uh, situation today, or this session, we'll be talking about... Uh, uh, no sound? I thought this one is the one. Okay. Okay. Again, uh, actually, uh, everybody knows, or uh, if you are working in ICU or anywhere, we are facing the CPRs and uh, cardiac arrest in any situation, regardless of ICU or not. But uh, actually, uh, it's the situation that everybody is afraid of. Doctors, nurses, they don't want the patient to reach that point. And uh, outside of the hospital setting, which is more difficult, seldom to find somebody who knows what to do. So uh, now, actually, uh, I'll be talking about the updates of American Heart Association regarding the CPR, uh, which are actually the latest updates came in November 2010, which is, I think, still not yet applicable in the training centers. But uh, uh, I think it, uh, this uh, updates makes CPR much easier than before. Even the algorithms are very simple. You don't need to think a lot. You don't need to remember anything. It just go ahead, and it's just one action to do. It will be fine. Uh, this presentation actually will summarize the key issues of uh, changes in the uh, 2010 American Heart Association guidelines for cardiopulmonary resuscitation and emergency cardiovascular care. Uh, it will focus on the resuscitation science and guidelines, recommendations that are most important of uh, conversional or well resulting in a change in the resuscitation practice and training. So uh, this 2010, actually, it was not uh, came just from somebody who was sitting and thinking about the guidelines. Actually, it came from like uh, evidence based. Actually, they gathered 356 experts in CPR around the world from 29 countries, and they had uh, a connection together, communication, and conference over 36 months, and they came with these updates. So our goal from any CPR is to have a high quality CPR. So we are trying to uh, let the body back to the normal situation of breathing and circulation to maintain the life or to keep his life. So high quality uh, CPR actually is focused on some points like a compression rate of at least 100 per minute. And actually I highlighted at least because we'll discuss that later why at least. A compression depth is at least two inches in adult and uh, uh, it will be uh, for uh, children and the infant will be uh, the depth of the, uh, at least of one third of the chest or anterior posterior uh, thickness of the chest. We have to allow the complete recoil of the chest. Actually, this one is important because in the new algorithm of CPR, the recoil, the full recoil of the chest is very important because it will save time too much. Minimizing the interruption of chest on compression during ch ch chest compression, and we have to avoid excessive ventilation. Compression to ventilation ratio should be 30 to 2 for single rescuer or adults and children and infants, and that excluding newly born infants. Okay, now you can see here on the uh, slide that this is the new algorithm of uh, BLS, okay, basic life support. And if you can see that we are changing from ABC, this one is not working. Okay, so we are changing from ABC to CAB, and we'll justify that. You can see that uh, actually the first thing of the CPR, we have to check the unresponsiveness of the patient, and we have to make sure that he's breathing or has any gasping breathing. Uh, then we have to go for to call the emergency, and then start CPR. Actually, starting CPR, that includes if you have an AED, you will connect the AED and follow the instructions. If you don't have, just go for hand on hands only CPR, cardiac massage only. You don't need to bother yourself with the breathing now, cardiac massage. Why CAB, not ABC? Majority of cardiac arrests occur in adults, and high heights, uh, actually the highest survival rates from cardiac arrest are reported among patients of all ages who have witnessed arrest. Why witnessed arrest always survives better than the people who did not have the witnessed arrest? 
because actually usually people they are finding uh, it's easier for them to start cardiac massage so they jump on the patient start giving them so ABC sequence which start with the procedure with the procedure that secure fine most difficult opening the airway which is actually is really difficult for an, uh, somebody who is not expert to open the airway and start doing the proper ACG uh, or proper CPR like what we have doing in the 2000s uh, 2005 uh, uh, CPR or the updates, the latest other came surely five years ago or six years ago. Starting with the chest compression might encourage more rescuers to begin CPR. So if you find somebody actually outside, lying down, unresponsive, not breathing, don't think about airway and giving an, uh, the two breaths, the rescuer breath, just start and give cardiac massage only until somebody who's really professional to give. So anyone can do CPR for anyone outside, right? Okay, now we have another update or another new thing, which is elimination of look, listen, and feel. We don't do now look, listen, and feel because I think this is actually is difficult for non-expert people and it's wasting of time. Look, listen, and feel was removed from the CPR sequence after delivery of 30 compressions. The lone rescuer opened the victim's airway and delivered the two breaths. So no rescuer to do two breaths. The first two breaths always go for cardiac massage, 30 compressions, then do whatever you want. Check the airway, give the two breaths, and continue CPR. So no more look, listen, and feel. Identification of agonal gasp. Rescuer should begin CPR if the victim is not breathing or only gasping. Okay, if you remember, before we used to uh, check the responsiveness. Nobody was thinking about breathing only responsiveness. Are you okay? Are you okay, right? You remember that? Not anymore. Look at your patient. He's, he looks like not responding from far, but you have to check his breathing, if he's breathing or not, or if he has gasping breathing. Because the breathing is briefly checked as part of check for cardiac arrest before the healthcare provider activates the emergency response system and retrieve AAG. Now, uh, Cricoid pressure, I think this cricoid pressure seldom to do it, but it's just like a procedure. Uh, if we have somebody to assist and helping us while you are ventilating the patient, we make a little or a slight pressure on the uh, cricoid uh, cartilage so we can compress the trachea over the esophagus. So the esophagus will be closed. So if you give air, the air will go to the trachea, not to the stomach. Actually, that's fine if you are really expert. So it's not recommended anymore because uh, because of the stressful situation, the stressful situation in the CPR, sometimes they make more pressure so they even occlude the trachea. So it's not recommended anymore to do cricoid pressure. It's different about the cricoid pressure, we do it during intubation, if you remember, okay? During intubation, doctor sometimes actually gives a slight pressure on the cricoid cartilage to see the vocal cords, but in fact this is different. This is during ambubagging with a mask to avoid air, air, stomach inflation. So it's not recommended anymore. Chest compression, push hard and fast, okay? No limits. If you remember, I mentioned that the heart rate or the compression rate should be at least 100 per minute, at least. So if you can give more, give. Allow complete recoil between compressions and rotate compressor every two minutes. Okay, allow complete recoil between compressions. Actually, that's important because now we are doing hands-only CPR, so there is no breathing but we are depending on that when you allow the chest to be fully recoiled, we will have passive breathing. That after the chest rise up, the, lung, the lungs will take some air. It's okay, we'll not take a full lungs air ventilation, but at least we'll take something. But circulation is more important than ventilation now. Activate of activation of emergency response system. The healthcare provider should check for response while looking at the patient, determining if he's breathing, or not, or if there is any abnormal breathing which is gasping. That's now. Before, in the old CPR guidelines, it was healthcare provider activate the emergency response system after finding an unresponsive patient. Actually, somebody who has hypoglycemia, he will be not responding, but he's alive. He does not need to call for CPR. Give him something sweet and everything will be fine, all right? 
chest compression rate at least 100 per minute. It is reasonable for lay rescuers and healthcare providers to perform chest compression at a rate of at least 100 per minute because in most studies, delivery of more compressions during resuscitation is associated with better survival and delivery of fewer compression is associated with lower survival. So no more counting as before when you say one and two and three to have the 100 per, uh, per minute, no. Just give it at least 100, try to give more, be fast and push hard and allow the chest to, back, to recoil to the normal position. Chest compression depth. The adult sternum should be depressed at least two inches. Before, or the old guidelines was saying about one to two inches, okay? but now at least two inches. Some doctors are thinking about uh, ribs fracture, but now we are thinking about the life uh, saving more than the ribs. The ribs can be corrected later. Uh, compressions created blood flow primarily by increasing intrathoracic pressure and directly compression the, the, uh, the heart. So deeper and compression is giving you more blood flow, which is the target to have better circulation and gas exchange. Actually, this uh, table is a little bit long table, but it summarizes uh, what I have said according to the ages. Mostly we are applying everything to uh, all adult children and uh, infants. AED. Now, uh, AED, before we were thinking that AED should be available in uh, common places like restaurants, uh, for, uh, you know, in the mall, anywhere outside of the hospital. But in fact, now all the defibrillators recently comes out are uh, prepared to be an AED. Because the integration of AED into the chain of survival system of public places, that's the old one, but now AED is considered for hospital setting as a way of facilitate early defibrillation. That means you have to defibrillate the patient or give him the shock within less than three minutes of the unresponsiveness. And especially in, in areas that the nurses are not familiar with CPR, they are not doing so frequent CPRs, and uh, uh, the defibrillator uh, are used infrequently. And they are not also expert to analyze the uh, ECG of the patient during the defibrillation, so not always they can do that, because you know, in ICU we see that every day, but otherwise they, could, they don't see that. So AED is very important even in a hospital. The rescuer provides CPR to a child in cardiac arrest and does not have an AED with pediatric dose attenuator system, the rescuer should use the standard AED, the one we use for adult. It can be used now, before it was not. For infants, less than one year old, a manual defibrillator is recommended rather than to use an AED. But if you don't have an AED, a defibrillator, a manual defibrillator, and you have only an AED, it's better to use the AED which is specialized or specific for children and infants, but even if you don't have it, you can use the standard AED for infants, okay? Before the guidelines, AED was contraindicated for infants, right? But now you can use the AED for all ages. Okay, now synchronization or synchronized cardioversion. Uh, we have to mention that actually because now all the defibrillators comes are biphasic, and we have the old one with monophasic uh, defibrillators. Anyway, synchronized cardioversion, it can be given in some situations like atrial fibrillation. And if you have biphasic energy, if you have a biphasic defibrillator, the energy you should deliver is 120 to 200 joules. And monophasic energy, the dose will be 200 joules. In atrial flutter, if you have biphasic or monophasic defibrillator, both of them you have to give 50 to 100 joules. Adult stable monomorphic VTAC, that means VTAC with a stable, clinically stable patient, we have to provide also synchronized cardioversion, uh, regardless it is biphasic or monophasic defibrillator with energy of joule. Precordial thumb, everybody knows the precordial thumb? To hit the patient in the chest? Okay. It's not allowed, not recommended anymore, okay? Especially if you don't like your patient, and some people, they use it just to release their pressure. And some people are actually boxing the patient hard. Maybe if he has a cardiac rhythm, he will not have anything anymore. Actually, it should be done gently, because it's not recommended anymore, but I can say that the precordial thumb may be considered in one situation, which is not a priority, if you, are, if you witness 
a patient, if you witness the patient who gets cardiac arrest right now, and he has a monitor, that means he has in a hospital, and the defibrillator is not around, it takes time to come. So if you want just to save the patient's life uh, within a quick time and nobody is there, so you can do it. But it should not affect the CPR or interrupt the CPR, and it should not delay the shock, okay? So it's not a priority. And uh, most of the time, when we call for CPR in, 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 in any unit, the defibrillator will be around the patient within less than, less than two minutes, I think. Capnography recommendation. Uh, I think capnography is one of the uh, new technology used in CPR now. Uh, capnography or the capnograph is just a, a sensor that can feel the uh, PCO2 that comes from the patient in a tidal volume post-expiratory, okay? So it can measure the CO2. If we measure the CO2, what do we need to have better CO2 or normal CO2 in our exhalation? What do we need for that? Gas exchange and circulation, right? If we have CO2, that means there is gas exchange. We are taking something from the blood and giving oxygen. Of course, it's not the only technology we use. Uh, in CPR, it's very recommended, and it can give you an indication that your patient endotracheal tube, the one inserted, is in the place, okay? Because, you know, in CPR, you don't, know, you don't need to do C a chest X-ray during the CPR. It does not make sense. So you need to know that if this endotracheal tube is giving adequate oxygen and making, and uh, it's in the place at least. And it's an indicator also for the uh, CPR quality. If you see this graph, in the A, you can see that before intubation, we have a straight line, okay? After intubation, the wave is rising up, and it's graduated from zero to 50 millimeter mercury. So if we reach up to 10, that means we are on the right side, okay? 10 and above is good. Below 10 is not good, that means there is a problem. So after intubation, you can see that there is CO2. Before intubation, there was no CO2, because no gas exchange. And now if you go to the B, down, it can tell you about the CPR quality. You see that in CPR, initially, when we start CPR, we, you know, the, uh, the, the circulation will be weak. By the time, it's accumulative actually. By the time, the circulation will be better. So you can see the wave is, is rising up. Rising up until we have the ROSC, which is return of spontaneous circulation. We have the readings that we can get it from the ABGs, which is normal PCO2. Okay, now uh, in a hospital setting, we are using ACLS. And the ACLS algorithm is a little bit uh, long one and complicated one, right? Actually, this is the shortcut of the ACLS. We will start with CPR with giving oxygen, and we have to attach the monitor uh, defibrillator, and then check the rhythm, okay? In the hospital, check the rhythm. If he needs cardioversion or needs shock, shock the patient, and then start CPR with cardiac massage of 30 compressions, okay? And keep monitoring the quality of the CPR. And during that, we need to give the medications, and we have to consider the advanced, advanced airway, and we have to treat the reversible causes, which are the five H's and five T's, which is mentioned in the square, actually on the left side. After the patient survive, we'll go to the post-cardiac arrest care, which is hypothermic bed, and anotropes, whatever the patient needs, we'll just provide it to him. So this is the ACLS. Before the ACLS was a very complicated, actually, algorithm. You have to go from here to there, one, two, four, eleven, and back again. It's a little complicated. This one is very easy one. ACLS drugs. Actually, all the drugs are the same, except atropine and adenosine. And we have a new medication, or not a new, but a new use for a new medication, which is amidoron. Atropine is not recommended anymore to be used if we have asystole. In the old guidelines, if the patient has asystole, we give atropine, not anymore. Atro atropine only for bradycardia. Adenosine. Adenosine can be given in case of sub, uh, supraventricular uh, ventricular tachycardia, okay? And uh, now we can say that can be given for all regular uh, narrow QRS rhythms. And can, it should not be given for irregular, okay? It should be regular narrow QRSs. Amidoron. Amidoron, actually, if we remember that in the uh, VTAC or uh, if we have uh, any, any uh, ventricular arrhythmia, we used to give lidocaine. But lidocaine is not recommended anymore. The recommendation now is for amidoron. And if amidoron is not available, we can go to lidocaine. 
Termination of resuscitation. Actually, before we had to terminate the CPR if we are exhausted and the patient did not return. But now, outside of hospital resuscitation, we have to arrest. Uh, we, uh, we have to stop CPR if arrest not witnessed by EMS, and if there is uh, no ROS certain within three complete uh, the rounds of CPR, that uh, no spontaneous circulation within three complete rounds, and if there is no EED shock delivered, that the patient did not have any rhythm. It's giving just as all the time. Uh, I think that I covered most of the uh, CPR spot points. Thank you very much.